All right, punks, hopefully some freaks too. Uh, this is In the Dragon's Maw. Um, I have been kicking around the idea for a while of doing like a structured panel show um, on topics that weren't so news cycle uh, sensitive. And uh, we're just going to do it now without all the structure and things, um, all shit faced. So, everybody, what's up? Introduce yourselves. Welcome to the Dragon's Maw. Can't believe we're broadcasting from a mouth. Um, Vogue Blackheart here, longtime Bitcoiner, uh, sipping some bourbon. I think it's natural that we would broadcast from the Maw. Uh, this BTC FUD may get referred to as user and uh i like that digital money come on marty uh marty i host the podcast tales from the crypt i write a newsletter marty's bent uh also work for a company uh great american mining where we're doing some mining and i'm drinking a corona light right now trying to stay on brand throughout this quarantine <gasps> We got we got somebody else who's gonna hop on mic or just gonna keyboard it. Hi everyone, my name is Carlso. I'm and I'm from the Netherlands. All right. So uh yeah, just gonna kind of loosely uh toss out, out the topic. topic the next ten years of Bitcoin and the biggest threats it will face. And I'm just full anarchy open go with go with your thoughts just just, just go for it i think we got to worry about chip centralization chip manufacturing being centralized in very few areas that's my biggest worry for bitcoin in the next 10 years uh beyond that apathy i've always said this apathy i get yelled at for saying it uh, because people think bitcoin is just gonna uh bend its will on people but my one of my biggest worries is people being sorry if this sounds crass but too dumb to understand what bitcoin is and to come around to it well i guess just round table to introduce each of our notions of shit uh mine is the dependence on the internet um you know, there's been some rabble rousers like Luke uh, Deshir screaming for block size reductions while people want to raise them. And uh, I think I am a little more radical than even Luke on that issue because I think that Bitcoin should be able to function if the internet starts breaking and fragmenting. And that means low throughput things like radio. And that's something I think that it is insanely important to build out infrastructure for as soon as possible. Come on, spotlight. I'm going to, I'm going to put the spotlight on a random person. Okay. Um, in a similar vein to a powerful actor that can uh, attack the internet infrastructure. I uh, think Bitcoin might have a lot to fear from uh, USG and the monetary authorities of the world when it um, becomes recognizable to them as the threat that it probably is. And the you know, very quiet standoff will become more a hot war. Anybody else got something they want to toss in the ring topic wise or we want to Pick one of these and start plumbing through it. I will pull teeth, fuckers. Been drinking. They'll slap butts. All right, Marty, fuck it. Let, let, let's dive into the, the chip centralization and, and production issues there. Like, like China. China. Um, yeah, I mean, obviously, most of the mining hardware to date has been produced in China. Uh, I think it is becoming more distributed over time and has up to this point. So the real uh, important thing is the foundries, the fabrication factories where these chips are actually produced. 
Um, there's very few that actually do the ASIC production that is used in Bitcoin mining. Uh, TSCM in Taiwan and then Samsung, I believe they're fab uh, foundries in South Korea. Um, but uh, the actual producers of the mining equipment are mainly in China at this point. I can definitely see uh, China sort of coming down on them particularly and then obviously TSCM being in Taiwan puts that in a precarious situation as China obviously wants to make Taiwan part of uh, China and they want to sort of overtake that and own that so that is a risk there. I think Samsung being in South Korea is a good thing and they're producing what's miners which I think will overtake Bitmain as the most uh, efficient and best performing miners as they have the designer who originally made the S9 working for them. He founded the company. Um, and he's proven throughout time to be able to build very e efficient machines. But with that being said, like you want to have more than two to three options for where these chips are, are uh, produced in my mind. People uh, have hinted that um, Intel and AMD are working on this stuff too outside of East Asia but until I see it it's going to be one of the biggest threats in my mind yeah and I mean like even South Korea I think is not I mean it's it's, it's not in the same kind of situation as Taiwan but it is definitely in a precarious situation being that close to China's like reach in terms of things but you know, I also do like. The, the, let's just put it this way: there, there are miners, like actually operating farms, who just straight fab their own chips, and they're outside of Asia, like very low key, low profile, and I think that's kind of the direction and the the solution for something it, like as far as just that whole choke point in the the supply chain at the root is a company being able to take a design and just go straight to a fab plant wherever because i mean like a lot of them are concentrated in asia but there's a decent amount in the rest of the world and approach them with a, a large enough order that they'll just mint them for you and it's 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 not an issue of like where do like the bit mains or the the what miners go to, and it, it, that's kind of a double edged sword because it's like it's it kind of solves that choke point, but it does so by hitting such a massive economy of scale that you wall out, uh, the kind of the lower level of players. Yeah, how much hash rate do you think, uh, those indie chip producers account for right now i mean honestly i couldn't really make any informed guess like beyond like at, at least a few percents of of the network or somewhere in that that range at some point in time you just have to have so much scale to make that make sense economically right um you need to have smart people who actually do the chip design you have to have a reason in the first place to want to do the chip design which is you're going to design something better than something you can buy um there's just so much organization that goes into that process before you take the output from that process and assemble it into a miner and then get miners somewhere to people who then actually install them in a mine and manage them at that level. Um, there's a lot of trouble, a lot of problems across that whole chain. Yeah, one thing I think I probably discount a lot too is the the limits that these miners are hitting physically like the, the physics that comes into play like is there a point in the next three five seven years where uh, everybody talks about asic commodification where we sort of hit that and the designs are, are sort of uh pretty comparable across the board and it's hard to sort of innovate at, at that level yeah i think that will drive most of that like vertical integration dynamic shift is exactly that you'll just have something that you you have your own version of or that maybe it's even an open license.
sorry, had to uh had to feed the head there. Um but it's it's like think about like how long um they had the intent to open source like their chip designs and I think they they might have kind of quietly in the background. And it's like it, when we hit those physical limits like it's I just have what I have and I get it made. Yeah, and then you also got to think that there's more overall investment in mind share comes to Bitcoin. You'll just have better competition at the design level and more people get interested in it. So maybe, maybe my uh, big 10 year worry for Bitcoin isn't that big after all. Well, I mean, I don't think it's because it's like that's kind of the double edged sword I was getting at, Marty, is like it's on the one side, it kind of addresses that production choke point. But then it crazily raises the barrier to entry. You know what I mean? Why would it? Why would it raise the barrier to entry if everything's commodified? Well, I mean, I'm talking commodified in types or in terms of like uh, we've we've, we've hit, hit the peak chip efficiency. There's no more better chip coming. Like, you know, everybody can get their hands on a chip design, but it's still like you have to go to the fab plant with enough money, um, you know, to actually get enough of those chips for them to actually do that. Otherwise, no, I'm going to deal with this guy. I'll make more money with him. He has a bigger order. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. So you'd have to solve that with more foundries, right? Add more supply to that, that level of the supply chain. Well, ultimately, it's kind of just like if, you know, it's like that issue solves itself where one player in the production point can't be that choke point, but it just moves that choke point now to the operator of the equipment. You know what I mean? Yep. So any big chip manufacturer that manufactures at a couple years old from cutting edge scale can be competitive in the minor market, right? Um, I don't know. Are the S19s a seven nanometer process? Um, it kind of doesn't matter exactly what they are. And I've kind of lost touch with what cutting edge microprocessors are. But what are we down to? Like four nanometer wiring being the very cutting edge. Um, and eventually you run into that. The thing is, um, mining chips for a while were made on the older hardware from whatever was cutting edge for CPU. So when CPUs were at 14 and going to seven, mining hardware was still getting made on 28 nanometer, for instance. So you, you want to have that come down and it will come down. And that comes down because bigger companies can place bigger orders with other bigger companies that can actually tool up to make those chips and everything. But then that company is going to be your supplier, you know, your Dell or your Apple out there selling you in mining hardware. And we want availability of that right um and we've always had tight supply of that and that's because this is a niche industry everything ebbs and flows there have been young companies a ton of them have failed because they don't have experience uh operating a full supply chain and how much time that takes and when things change x happens like you can imagine anybody making miners today or say two months ago as china shut down for covid um it puts a crimp in everybody's supply chains when they can't get a power supply cable that you know is like 80 cents but they thought they'd always be able to order them by the week you know or whatever to have just enough on hand um so end of day i think we just want all that stuff to be available and that being a thing i would throw another wrench in here there is an actor out there that can produce things at scale as cheap as anybody and can sink as much money as they want to 
into whatever their endeavor is and they're called the government and they do this all the time for military type matters and i would posit there is a potential future out there where the cutting edge of this and ultimately the efficiency optima is occupied by a government that can commit people at scale to making the best chips um to producing something that is considered a, a national security issue um you know the backing of your money and you know some place like for instance russia a country that can make nuclear powered nuclear missiles in secret for over a decade and then reveal it to the world could have a process like this say say they imagined that bitcoin had a, a footing with gold and they wanted to back that well there's also enough math and science and computer science guys over there um, that could make that happen and could make it happen out of the public view and they just happen to have the energy resources that go along with that that you might want to use with all those chips and they have national security to the point that they could do that in secret or in quasi secret um so i i think it'd be interesting that is a future too where you have the state come in and you see something like a, a fed or a treasury morph into a, a production facility where some of that is just occupied by the state in the united states i would say we had a tva lock and dam system for a while that electrified part of the united states and a lot of those um, plants went offline at some point um, because they were non-modern and there were other things that were built elsewhere and whatnot. You could reopen space like that and use hydro or um, use hydro with a mix of something else. And the government owns those sites. So if, if they really wanted to stay in the monetary system, say you thought Bitcoin was going to eclipse gold and look like a reserve asset. And I, I know plenty of people disagree with this as a potential way to go. But imagine if a central bank at that point said, OK, I still want to be able to print fiat currency that we're going to use inside my country, but I want to manage this reserve asset. I could see the government morphing it into a manager thereof. Dude. It would be hard to compete with in that scenario. And see, this this is okay. We we've kind of just wander walked away from solely the issue of chip manufacturing as a choke point. But I got it. I got a drunk springboard um, from that. the The interesting issue there too is Bitcoin bonds are a thing you can do. And really, in a purely Bitcoin world, who are the only people who can confidently make good on a promise for something like a Bitcoin bond denominated in bits miners? And it's like there's this interesting thing where if if large governments do not fragment and break up, then there is every incentive to the world or in the world to scramble to become big miners to be able to raise money for a budget on a bitcoin bond if bitcoin just keeps happening anyway uh even though these big governments don't break apart like a lot of us think they will yeah and i guess another question that comes into play is at what point are they late to these efforts and like is bitcoin the supply is sufficiently distributed now, maybe in a couple of years, what do we got past 18 and a half million have become to market are already free float floating on the market. Like even if they do get all that mining infrastructure, we'll be able to mass enough to, to affect the network in such a way. And then at the competition at the chip level, like are they going to be able to, to produce enough to, to compete with the free market? Um, and overtake the free market at the end of the day. And then if the chips are commodified to a certain extent, like are they dumb enough where even if the government is producing them, like people would be able to tell if they're they're backdooring them or anything like that or doing something like ASIC boost or amp lead. Mm -hmm. And uh we got another addition uh to the group Bitcoin Tina just showed up. What's up, Tina? Oh, okay. characteristically quiet. <laughs> yes. 
This is not the Tina I was looking for. I'll speak for him. We're going to get your nads ripped off trading. No, we can't hear you, Tina. Uh, ch check your uh, audio settings and see if the input's set right with the, the headset. But, um, yeah, but it's it's like to, to kind of get to that while Tina's uh, sorting that out, like the the whole weird dynamic with like big government existing while bitcoin succeeding is like it just boils down to do they exist or not while bitcoin is at a critical threshold and like by exist i mean do people believe the meme will the cops still show up and, and crack people's heads and throw them in a cage will the the troops still shoot bullets and if it still exists, they can just lock down all the power production and just they own that now. Their shit. Yeah, like where are we as a society if it gets to that point, right? Like, and especially now during this quarantine, this coronavirus hysteria, I think people are very much starting to question the government and the institutions that are supposed to be authority figures within our world, like weren't you guys supposed to prevent all this? Like, what the fuck am I paying taxes for? Like, if you could just print money, why do I even pay taxes? Like, people are starting to ask those hard questions. That's another thing I brought up more recently, too, on, on Tales from the Crypt, is, like, do we over-index the, the future power of the government? Like, it is a confidence game at the end of the day, and it seems like confidence is waiting. About the time you get the third or fourth round of those checks, or say you got them monthly, like a paycheck, uh, I think that question would slowly sink in. And uh, what you opened with in terms of it, it being hard to help people understand Bitcoin, um, I think that's because it's hard to understand money. And that's because the environment that we're surrounded in is not the classical environment of money and how we understood money for a very long time before the period now. So, um, yeah. No, I agree. I mean, we do live in an anomaly of human history, right? Especially with, in terms of money. Like, I've been getting into debates where people are really, really starting to think that modern monetary theory makes sense. And it's been infuriating because they say, oh, QE just doesn't, do a, just doesn't do a good enough job of allocating the capital. Like, where QE goes wrong, modern monetary theory steps in basically produces the flows of capital that QE comes up short with. And people actually think like this is a good way to run a monetary system. And that's one of my other fears too, is like if we just try that whole experiment and that takes up a decade or whatever. Yeah, so here's the thing. Um, the Fed added what, two trillion or something to its balance sheet here lately, or almost, or that package was two trillion, this, the, whatever they called it. Um, how much of that, again, went to people or is going to go to people in the form of $1,200 checks, uh, you know, 300 bills of that or whatever, or like 15%. So uh, that is because the Fed understands that if they did helicopter money direct to people, they would get exactly the present they always wanted, which is inflation. And it would come and it would chase them down and they would do their best to deal with it. But at the end of the day, it's very hard to predict what people do, especially when you give them piles of free money. So yes, there is a problem with the way we're allocating this capital. We're bailing out those at the top that happen to have failed. And in some cases, we're giving tons of money to what are like almost quasi government entities like Boeing and Lockheed, et cetera, that almost act as a uh, private skunk works um, for the US government, the way they make most of their income. And uh, I, I don't know that there, there are some advantages to having some production facilities kept inside the government, especially military stuff in my mind, right. And now we're coming to realize, yeah, well, you might also want to have some ventilators on hand, right? Or you might want to have this or that, you know, thing, uh, maybe there are some healthcare things that it makes sense for us to handle in common. And those are questions we're going to perpetually have to talk about. But I think people will wake up to these numbers. And I'm really happy to see the tweets where they're like, okay, we just added $40,000 per family to the government debt or per person, you know, whatever the number is, right? You get a check for 1200 bucks. How do you like that math? 
Yeah, and also uh, that people uh, are starting to wonder, like, uh, why the, uh, with all this money printing, why do we have to pay taxes every year if they can print it anyway? That's a major change in in, uh, in people's notice. Right, and then it's going to be. Uh, can can we get a mic check from Tina? I, I'm sure he's he's screaming to to get in on this right now. No, I'm just listening. Uh, can you hear me now? Okay. Yeah, there there we go. Okay. Hey, Marty. How you doing? Better now that you're here. You're a uh, sweetheart, Marty. I know. I, I, I was just trying to catch up where you guys are and, and, and what you're talking about. I don't really feel like I have anything to add this very second. I'm just trying to get a, uh, a my bearings um, where you're going with this. Well, I got a question for you, Tina. Like, you believe they're going to go through forward like MMT? Like, and you think it's inevitable? And this is good for Bitcoin. We all agree on that. But like, when do people lose confidence, if at all? Do you, you think people just get strung along with all this monetary intervention? It, it's hard to know exactly how all of this proceeds. I was saying to people, mostly in tweets, not so much on pods, because I thought that it might have damaged my credibility starting to tell people that they're going to see UBI and MMT. But I've been saying generally in just conversations with people as well as tweeting numerous times in the past year that we would see UBI and MMT this decade. And it seems to me that this whole episode with Corona has accelerated this process. I was thinking that we'd see it certainly in the next presidency. Um, possibly slightly after that. So I was thinking somewhere between potentially 2024, 2025. Now I kind of think we can see it 2020. I think that people are concerned about their own livelihood. We, we've got a very strange situation right now where a lot of people are very worried about putting food on the table. $1,200 does not last you 10 weeks. That is at 50% of the poverty level for one person. That's an absurd notion that uh, Steve Mnuchin said. I think it was embarrassing that he said that. Um, <clears throat> so I think there are a lot of people who are very concerned about their financial situation. A huge portion of the country does not have anywhere near enough money to shelter at home without working. So I think you have a lot of people who are very nervous, very scared. You have food lines, which to the extent that I don't think we've seen since the 30s. So <clears throat> I think a lot of people are very worried and the government is going to end up having to do more. I don't know what it looks like yet. Uh, I think, like I've said previously, that you know politicians love to spend money and this gives them an excuse. There's so much bad, I think, that has come out of this. <clears throat> There's a lot of concerns that people have about uh, privacy issues. Uh, there are all kinds of issues that people are very worried about. <laughs> I don't think they're wrong to be worried about them. And I'm not quite sure how it looks or how it plays out. And I think that, who knows, um, you may see some demagogues coming out of this. It's, it's, it's very strange. It's, it's, a, it's very surrealistic. And I don't quite know how it plays out. I think that people are going to not be happy with having all kinds of money flow to people at the top without seeing some of it themselves. So it's, it, it, it's bizarre. I think we desperately need uh, a new financial system, but Bitcoin's not ready anytime soon. It has to be a lot larger. And I do think the policies that are already in place and will continue to see in place will very much help Bitcoin quite a lot. And I think you're going to see shockingly large numbers <clears throat> from the federal government, from the Federal Reserve, other central banks. And like, you know, to kind of tie that back to the, the whole discussion we were having on, I don't know, we started with like <laughs> the, the centralization choke point of chip manufacturing and got to the incentives for nation states to start mining themselves and like that's the kind of thing i'm worried about is you know if they really go that route and it's just helicopter money all around then 
yeah, smart people are going to buy shit like Bitcoin, like gold, like strategic investments. They they will get what's going on, but that's not the majority of people. And the majority of people will look at that helicopter money and the government giving it to them like, yes, you are my savior. And that's, again, you know, in the mind, it's that government still exists. Those cops will still enforce the laws. They will still throw you in a cage. Those soldiers or those soldiers will still fire bullets. So they still own the power production. I don't know, man. I think some people have this like innate, like, and I wrote about it a couple of weeks ago when Dave Portway from Barstool Sports was lamenting against the Fed, saying they were creating shroop bucks. Like, I think people have, people know <laughs> something's fucked up. Like, and I, I, I don't think people are stupid enough to look at what the Fed's doing and be like, like, I mean, you can't print money for nothing. But then again, there's plenty of examples throughout history. Maybe I'm speaking out of my ass here, of like Venezuela and Zimbabwe and Argentina. There were there were useful idiots there too. Who knows? I, I, I'm I try to be more optimistic about people's uh, ability to to get this stuff, but maybe history proves me wrong. I I try for the optimism, Marty, but a, a resident idiot in the den here uh, just tried arguing the other day that reusing the same address is better for your privacy on Bitcoin than using a different one every time. Um, I just dealt with somebody two days ago who who is like we can just turn the economy off except for like getting people food and just turn it on what's the problem with that yeah yeah i'm too optimistic probably yeah i i think to well not to say you're too optimistic but i think that the general want of mmt to manage it all it it sounds to me it gets towards an organized economy which is what we get taught the ussr did which is what we get taught made them fail because all those entities in that system ultimately gamed it and the people at the top that were looking at the data couldn't predict what people wanted at the end of the day um and it seems like that and though you're not saying you know exactly what people want or anything um monkeying around with money supply to try to tailor inflation this way or that way is a recipe for you know a, a cauldron boiling over eventually so I, I just put this in the chat i think that the the three problems we laid out at so far at the beginning mining chip production centralization dependence on the internet and u.s government uh intervention when they see what's going on th these are all going to wind up being a three-headed hydra that's one thing i i, th I think that's where, where we're going to wind up at the end of this no i agree and i think the conversation we're having right now in terms of the efficacy of the government's policy in terms of printing money really will decide whether or not uh, specifically point three in the list u.s government intervention plays a significant role uh in the potential um takedown of bitcoin in the future like i'm becoming more skeptical that people are are not going to lose confidence in the whole the whole system i mean i think that's already happening it's just they'll look for the uh what the the life preserver they'll look for the rope and it's the government throwing it i don't know then you see that video of that dude vic or whatever his name is from new york in his uh in his car like lamenting against the bailouts and stuff like that like people are getting legitimately pissed off and i think we do again talking about being born at a weird inflection point in history like the technology we had to communicate how fucked up all this shit is, is is like never before like even in 2008 even though we had occupy wall street like twitter was not what it is today social networks were not what they are today like are we at a weird point in human history where we actually have the ability to get everybody on the same page so this is pretty fucked up yeah but it's like and like, i know the guy you're talking about that that the guy is brilliant 
fucking wig out Italian rant. It's top tech stuff. But I think the important takeaway from that, even though every single thing he said was on fucking point, was the the I'll take the check if I get it. What if the checks keep coming? They just don't stop. Well, if I was theoretically a person that didn't get a check and they keep coming for people who do get checks, uh, you can count that my temperature is going to go up over that. So everybody has to get a check now. I want my check. All right. It's a check for you and a check for you and a check for you. Thank you, Oprah, and a check for you. Um, th there's, you know, there's some big problems because the euro dollar market is enormous. I was listening to a number the other day said there's $57 trillion in debt in the euro dollar market and not enough money. And then $47 trillion was the number for non-financial debt in the U.S. <clears throat> These numbers are very large, and this is a huge hole that the Fed is going to have to fill. Uh, the implication was that the size of the Fed's balance sheet, which is in the neighborhood of six and a half trillion now, will potentially have to grow dramatically larger to help fill uh, the numbers from the offset of the need to sell that debt to raise dollars to satisfy uh, the call that they become. They become a sort of a, a synthetic call on the dollar. So we have a system which has grown enormously complicated after. 30 plus years of uh, crazy financial policies. And it's really hard to know exactly how this plays itself out. <clears throat> it, it seems like the process of all of this has really accelerated. And I don't know how we can call exactly how it's going to be. And there will be checks to people, plus there'll be the Fed will explode its balance sheet in numbers which i think are really pretty much unthinkable kinds of numbers it's 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 a little confusing you're gonna have to kind of watch it i i think that people the problem is if we do start really handing out money and get velocity then that will give us inflation cpi ppi kind of inflation <clears throat> which is what people think inflation is they don't see inflation as being money supply and that can be incredibly painful to the average person. Um, <clears throat> this per same person, was Luke Roman, who was commenting on this, was saying that because of a law that was passed in uh, 1995 relating to compensation, that compensation of executives in excess of a million dollars went uh, only up to a million dollars of cash compensation was tax deductible and anything in excess had to be incentive compensation and then he commented that looking at numbers on uh personal pce um oh, now i can't think what pce stands for but basically that's consumption in the economy um i can't think what it, i can't think of the uh, the term for it that Capital gains and IRA redemptions accounted <clears throat> for 200% of the increase in, P in, in uh, PCE growth. Personal consumption expenditures. Thank you. Um, which means that we're highly dependent on a stock market going up. But it's not clear to me. I know people think that this is going to be a replay of 2008 and nine, but we didn't pass money out in checks in 2008 and 9. I, I don't know if the stock market will or won't go up in that environment. I expect to see the Fed pegging the yield curve. We, we have so many different moving parts and so many different crazy things going on that it's really hard to know how this works itself out because it, it's just it's nowhere near what we've historically thought of as an intelligent way to handle fiscal and monetary policy. And yet the demands are going to call for crazy policy. So 
how do you evaluate? And you, know, you have people looking at stocks and wanting to buy stocks because they see the Fed doing these things, and yet we're likely to go down and we're we're going to move over to crazy town, and we're going to be living in crazy town, and we're going to think the world is the same world as it was 25 years ago, but it's not. It's very hard to evaluate, and and, and that will slowly start to dawn on investors when they start to realize, hey. This ain't your daddy's or granddaddy's recession or depression. And it's really hard to forecast how this thing plays itself out. And there are a lot of ways that it goes wrong. How do you invest in a market or judge company performance in a market where the supply chain is so fucked up that you simultaneously have price deflation on the producer side and massive pressure that's trying to get tamped down artificially for price inflation on the consumer side? How, like, how the fuck do you make sense of and invest in that? How does a business operate in that? It illustrates the bottlenecks in the system really well, right? What we're in right now. The idea that cows can be going to zero like oil, but meat at the supermarket is overly expensive because packing plants are closing. Yeah, and like I mentioned this on Block Digest earlier this afternoon, but if we keep the economy shut down for an extended period of time, we're in the same exact situation that Germany was during the Weimar Republic where they – not not the exact same, but they had a situation where they shut down their economy, and that's what led to their hyperinflation when they had to pay back reparations on their debt from World War One. France came and occupied them, and as a reaction to that, and the France France came to occupy them to make sure they were getting their money from the companies within the Weimar Republic, and as a reaction to that, the government told the companies not to go to work and that they would print money, put it and give it to them so that they can live while they're not working. And that's not the same exact thing. That's exactly what we're doing. <laughs> Excuse me. It's very similar to what we're doing right now in the U.S. where we have the economy shut down and we're talking about UBI straight into people's bank accounts when people aren't producing stuff. So you're going to have more and more money fighting for less and less goods. It's, it's, it's the exact same thing with a virus on top. So that's I will have a question. Uh, uh, do, do you guys see at some point an attempt from uh, the IMF to issue a currency direct from them with maybe UBI in debt? Uh, God, I hope not. I mean, they already have the SDR, which is like they're slowly moving to that that basket of currencies that they it's like a quasi stable coin. Um, they've been building that basket, but the IMF is evil. We should we should hope. I mean. And what are they connected to? To that's like the monster coming out from behind the curtains. Like, is the IMF going to direct deposit into our bank accounts or into our uh, central bank digital currency accounts at some point soon? So yeah, I think that maybe they just uh, provide an app uh, that people can download, and when you download, you get your UBI. So people will will have uh, a reason to download it. I think that is closer to the answer to a question of when the current monetary situation comes to a standstill and or fails. So when everybody's debt numbers get up high enough and something, some domino tips over and causes basically the whole board to go down and then they have to decide, well, what are we going to do next? What's the rules of the next game? That's when you can start talking about SDRs. Or that's just, yeah, yeah, that's just one potential answer. Gold's a potential answer. I don't know, highly regionalizing everything might be an answer. Okay, dude, I need to just wild card, throw something out on the table here. Because um, I think this would be interesting to talk about. Um, this was actually <clears throat> something Caso uh, threw out in, in the, the den here a while back. But, you know, it, it's like we, all of us here know that if the central banks started doing digital currencies that just straight interacted with the, the citizen <clears throat> slash consumer, that, that would just annihilate the entire private financial sector and just cut them <clears throat> like right out of the middle. 
So like Caso kind of put forward the idea, what if they do that? And then the private financial sector pivots to Bitcoin products to uh, kind of survive that and also as a fuck you back. Yeah, so this is an interesting topic, right? Because if the central bank comes in and says, we want to offer you database money, a la PayPal, Venmo, whatever you want to call it, and we want to be your counterparty where you hold your money, they just cut all the commercial banks, which are the majority of the banks we would know as citizens here in the United States, out of that system. So the question is, well, what do they have to do now? And uh if if we got to that point, especially if uh, Bitcoin continues to grow, then maybe there's other things for them to custody for people. I think in order for that something like that to work, they would have to try to do something like co-opt Facebook, because I don't think that the uh, central banks, the Federal Reserve, <clears throat> has any kind of infrastructure in place that could handle any kind of a distribution network. I don't know how that would work. I think another question you'd have to ask yourself, uh, Simon Dixon was mentioning this in discussing something like a, uh, a central bank digital currency. Is that going to be debt-based money? See, we, li we live in a system where our money is essentially debt-based because <clears throat> money is created from lending which is how we create money and or is that going to be more like actual printing of currency which is what we don't do um you know what exactly will that be if it was more printing and it's not debt based it's not going to create debt which is going to kind of be a have <clears throat> a downward pressure on the economy from that debt that's an obligation if it's more something that's not debt-based. I, I don't even know what a central bank digital currency looks like. Um, I would think that might be more inflationary by its nature. It's really hard to speculate on what they might do since I'm not sure they know what they want to do. Although I will tell you that one of the things that these guys do is they spend, they spend all their time dreaming up crazy stuff. Yeah, so, and, uh, when you think about the central bank, uh, it, it's it's normal to assume that uh, they want to stay in power. So even if they have to sacrifice the commercial banking sector, yeah, they will do that in order to stay in power. And yeah, like Shinobi said, uh, they will search for uh, to stay in business in some way. And Bitcoin could be part of it. What do you mean? Like I said, like you said, but uh, Marty. You, you, you want to jump in on this? Yeah, well, I, I want to echo what Tina said. Like, I, that's another thing we discount. Like, these central banks are completely technically inept. So, I think they would have to co opt something like a Facebook to do that. And speaking to like how the central bank digital currency works, or it has to be similar, it could have to be similar to Bitcoin in the aspect that, like, you know, there's only a certain amount, right? Uh, maybe like a non-fungible token like model or a fungible token like model with a somewhat cap supply with an inflation rate i don't know um but yeah i mean luckily i mean we're seeing somewhat bitcoin native banks pop up i mean cash app square they just got their banking license and they already have bitcoin integrated we have avanti in wyoming which is um becoming a very favorable for Bitcoin or Fidelity is not a bank, um, but it is a financial services provider and uh, um, they're working on wild infrastructure. Maybe they could turn into a Bitcoin back in the future. I mean, uh, it seems like Square specifically um, is sort of positioning themselves for this type of future. Um, and disclaimer, Cash App is a, a sponsor of my podcast, but uh, outside of that sponsorship, I Chill. I am very interested in their uh, in their fascination with Bitcoin and their their ability to uh, offer it uh, and custody it alongside traditional financial products and banking services too. 
So banking is coming to Bitcoin. You know, there are the BlockFi's of the world out there that basically want to custody for you. They want to give you a yield on that. And there are other products coming around that. I love the idea of credit cards paying you back in Bitcoin. I think the market will embrace that. And that's going to give some funny money to a lot of people that would never bought it otherwise to go play with it. But that in general, it's an up and coming industry, it seems. Yeah, and I mean, it's like, I'm kind of skeptical on where it goes, but I do think there are companies, you know, like Square and Cash App that are going to try to do it as not legacy as possible, but it's it's definitely going to happen. And it's like, my thing is like, if a central bank really went that full like just give you a wallet route and it's like a google a facebook just write a check and done and now they have some political points over the government whatever but like that that would just draw a line it's like that and all the legacy financial system and the legacy financial system would had would have every incentive to just full steam jump on board with bitcoin well no you you also have to think about the progress bitcoin has made to this point right like maybe it's just like naturally integrating itself in these services again going back to square uh, Fidelity, Avanti popping up, BlockFi, Unchained. It seems like just naturally Bitcoin is, is sort of creating these services. Maybe that's the optimistic tone. We can, I know I'm an eternal optimist on in this channel, but uh, at least today, like maybe Bitcoin provides a controlled sort of transition and maybe Bitcoin's success and progress up to date is is, is a good um, at a good pace and will continue at a good pace to facilitate a somewhat um, a smooth transition. I mean, it won't be uh, incredibly smooth. It will obviously be some some uh, some tumult as people sort of have to rewire their brains to this new paradigm, but it seems like uh, we are building this, this fallback system in parallel to this crumbling system uh, pretty well up to this point. Oh, like, my, my, I made my peace with Bitcoin banks years ago. It's a natural thing that's going to happen. But the beauty of Bitcoin is that it can be made perfectly interoperable with the guy who uses Bitcoin natively. It's just done. Like, it even shines a light on the cryptography necessary to offer centralized things with better security trade-offs or privacy trade-offs that could still be compliant potentially with stupid regulations like <clears throat> it's it's still a net improvement and then hopefully in the generational churn everyone just winds up using it natively so one of the fun things about CBDCs is central banks still don't know what they would issue and what qualities it should have. I caught a really quick video of Lagarde the other day answering somebody's question, you know, as head of the ECB. And uh, I forget exactly what the question is, but she starts talking about the other agencies they work with to develop these CBDCs and stuff. And eventually she says, well, we don't know exactly what properties this should have. Uh, do people want this because it's faster, because it's cheaper, or because it gives banking services to anybody? And uh, to me, her saying that means you've got smart guys studying niches of this to see kind of where it's at, what can the tech do, et cetera, but you don't even know what product you want to offer yet. Oh. It's because they wholly misunderstand money, right? That's what that those comments would say to me. <laughs> like you, you're trying to offer people a money, and, and you're just thinking about the speed of the rails and not the actual commodity underlying them.
All right, so I'm gonna I'm gonna go full Alex Jones here for a second. Um, you are you guys all aware that Paul Krugman once said <clears throat> that he became an economist because it was the closest thing that he could find to uh, a psycho historian, um, a practicer of the the fake science from um, Isaac Asimov's Foundation trilogy. Yeah, I've never heard that, but that makes sense Krugman's you, a fucking idiot you 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 know the the foundation trilogy though right yeah I haven't, haven't read it yet but i've 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 heard plenty of downloads about it it's it's like and it's just think about that the, a science that predicts air quote people but really it just controls them because it only works when you know the things that they're going to react to. So you have to artificially instigate the things they'll react to. And that's the whole lie of it. Um, <clears throat> to socially engineer society in a predecided direction. Um, that's why Paul Krugman became an economist because an economist was the closest thing to a practicer of that. Yeah, I mean, it doesn't surprise me. All these people are psychopaths. I mean, it gets back to what I was saying about MMT earlier. It's like the extension of QE and these policies. They just, they're like, ah, oh, their excuse is uh, QE's. Uh, it's just, it's the flow of the capital is getting stuck at the banks because people don't want to take out loans. So MMT just takes it to the nth degree and decides where that flow of capital goes. And, and the underlying theme of both these policies is that you have very few people think they can micromanage a very complex system. And Krugman being one of them, he's one of the thought leaders in that space. Yeah, and exactly, like, j jump in with that, Fudd. So to me, Lagarde's comments mean something closer to she sees people reacting to what she sees as a product, which is cryptocurrency. And she, uh, you know, they just released a paper the other day that talks about different um, uh, qualities that a cryptocurrency can have and, you know, some of the subdivisions and stuff like that, right? And she's seeing all this and she's seeing Mindshare go there. She's seeing a slow trickle of dollars go there. She's seeing uh, a section of the populace go there. And she's saying, well, let's keep them here with us. Let's keep the power with us. Let's keep invested in our money system. What product can we give them that they want? And she's not realizing she doesn't have that product on offer, which is just honest money. That simple. I, I just don't see uh, central bank digital currencies as being a reality for years to come. I can't imagine that it won't, that it won't, that it will be a reality before 2030 or later. We're dealing with a system which is enormously large. Um, the payment system is just huge. I mean, just think about the payments you make in the course of a day, a week, a month, and you're just one person. And the, the payment system is so big, it's so integral to the way an economy works. I think we're really very, very far away from this. And I think that it takes so long for this to happen. I think we can see an enormous movement in Bitcoin along the way as you see these crazy policies that are occurring. You know, what the Fed is doing is generally at much larger levels where they're doing things like buying up uh, treasuries, buying up corporates, buying up mortgages. Um, in the interim, Bitcoin, I think, can go up an enormous amount in terms of its value, which starts to bring other players in to look at Bitcoin seriously. Players like Square, except larger institutions, Bitcoin at $100,000, $200,000, $500,000, you're going to have very, very large players come and say, we need to start getting a piece of this. And... <sighs> The alternatives to the existing system that we have <clears throat> are just not there at this point. So Bitcoin can do an awful lot of growing in its size. There can be an awful lot of development 
in its basic protocol tech, in lightning tech, in tech from potential scaling layer development by players that are not in the Bitcoin ecosystem yet. So I think that I think that um, Bitcoin actually has an enormous lead at this point because we have an idea of what Bitcoin is. We have an idea of how it's going to scale. Um, there are people who will begin to start to see the need to own this thing. Bitcoin actually is the leader in this race, and Bitcoin is actually well ahead of everybody else. Bitcoin actually, at this point, looks like the most obvious surefire winner in this process and benefits from the massive confusion that there is out there and from the policies that you're going to see implemented by governments, by central banks. Um, we're actually way ahead of everybody else. We're years ahead of everybody else. Yeah, and I hate to uh, have to end here. I got to go spend some time with my family, but I, I want to piggyback on what Tina just said there and just from my experience with Great American Mining and what we're doing in oil fields here in the US, like we're going to ingratiate institutions outside of financial institutions, like other big players, like the energy uh, sector. And Bitcoin has obvious implications, positive implications for their businesses and their supply chains and their revenue and profits, revenue streams and profits on those revenues, where it's going to be undeniable that no central bank digital currency can provide them with the benefits that Bitcoin can. And that's some like I, you just got to sit back in awe at what Satoshi created and wonder if he even understood what he was unleashing on the world. Like Bitcoin, the sound money it provides us with so many benefits in and of itself, but then just the way the system operates provides so many secondary and tertiary benefits across different sectors of the economy and, and the world that were probably hard to foresee when you were just launching uh, a network that ran on CPU power. So. This Bitcoin is literally attaching itself to many very important industries, and that in and of itself may um, may like sow the seeds of its inevitable success in the future. Well said. It'll also sow the seeds of a lot of uh, the friction that's yet to come against the legacy powers. That's where I think you will you will start to see them get really aggressive in their efforts to relegate Bitcoin to just a weird stonk that people can trade in a KYC AML white zone with um, probably much more severe uh, treatment of uh, dark Bitcoin or uses of Bitcoin uh, with anonymization properties. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I couldn't, disagree. I couldn't disagree more strongly with that. I completely disagree with that. Bitcoin will grow in size, it will grow in market cap, it will grow in user base. And along that way, you'll grow a giant internal market where people will not have to go to exchanges. And there will be intermediaries that form that want to do business who will uh, take up the slack and deal with those issues. I see those as being very, very minor things. I think those are nothing more than a temporary speed bump. I actually am not concerned about that at all. And I think people, as long as they're concerned about it, it's a good thing because they will <clears throat> look to develop in ways to route around those potential issues. But I don't think that will prove to be much of a road bump or speed bump at all. Um, I'm actually not that worried about that. Size really changes everything with regard to Bitcoin. Bitcoin at a half a million, at a million, at $2 million, $10 million, it becomes a very different animal and a very different beast and very hard to contain. Even if it does achieve a large stakeholder base within the halls of power, um, the you know sectors with uh, the ear of government, people within government, that doesn't stop government and its associates from having um, an institutional incentive to oppose Bitcoin. I didn't in... say that. I didn't okay. say that at all. I didn't Shinobi say that. left field rum reality check. Um, <laughs> Before the reality check, I got to get out of here, gentlemen, and any ladies um, that are in here. I really love you guys. Keep fighting a good fight. Take cool. care, Marty.
for enjoying. Yeah. Cheers, Monty. Uh, Glad get, you could join us for this. Thank you for having me. Get your P to EPs up and running. I'm working on mine right now. So long, Marty. <laughs> nice to see you. Always a pleasure, Tina. Hey, Marty. But, um, but fucker, what was I going to say? Rum fueled reality check. Um, all it takes is one dude getting dead because he he didn't do some privacy thing or couldn't do some privacy thing and somebody found out that he had a bunch of bitcoin and so they made him dead so that it could be their bitcoin and then at least in america woo! legal tornado all of those barriers must be shredded now because that guy got dead it would be best if he uh, had a middle class background and a nice loving family Mm -hmm. but it's like it's inevitable right now we have an enormous economy where they still use cash to do things that they don't want to report and I just think that that kind of idea that you're going to use cash is going to come back with a vengeance and that cash is going to be bitcoin and when you have enough people using things and we're not there yet we're 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 very far from that you're not going to see that probably for five to possibly eight ten years Um, and i actually don't think bitcoin has to be spent very much in the next two three four five years but you're going to have tens of millions of people and hundreds of millions of people using this thing. And you're going to have merchants who are going to want to tap into that giant base where they can do some business. Um, I, I think we tend to look at things from a more parochial perspective. And when things grow in a much larger, it, it, it how many people have ever gone to the store and say, uh, Discount for cash? That's a pretty common thing, and people know how to do that. You're going to see for Bitcoin, it's going to be amazing. People are not stupid. Um, I, I have a lot of confidence in, in in how people behave and how they act, and and I'm I'm not so I'm not so worried about that. I think that that's uh, it's nothing more than a minor. Uh, it's a speed bump, nothing more. Imagine a future in which your credit card company wasn't out there to bend you over and sell all your purchases to everybody and profile you and quote unquote anonymize the data and resell it, but they were a security company that shared none of that and had terms of service that they would never share any of that and you could pay them in Bitcoin every month. But no, seriously, seriously though, like all of those arguments against privacy because they are just just happening on Bitcoin, which is a totally inverted privacy model compared to conventional private siloed databases. All it takes is that one dude that dies because somebody took advantage of that difference, saw he had a bunch of money or even just thought he had a bunch of money because he didn't know how to read what's happening on a blockchain and the dude winds up dead and that all those arguments just start falling flat in in the court of public opinion i don't think the court of public opinion has ever condemned cash i think we've been sold the idea that it's dirty that it's drug money that it's used by those that don't want to follow the rules yada yada but the utility it always has been and you know probably bare instruments always will have some utility in society i think most people think that because most people don't consider whatever they want to do heinous they just want to you know buy this buy that whatever so the whole problem of the internet hasn't been touched on so far so I have a little bit more of a problem with this because there's there's two layers to this. You can say it's a problem of the internet or it's the problem of 
a communications problem, right? So if you go to radio or whatever, there's ways to monitor and fuck with private, uh, pirate radio and everything else. Uh, so the question is, is it a communications medium issue or what? Because we all need the internet and we might not need it quite as much as we need electricity, but in the modern era, especially economically and certainly socially, we need the internet a lot or network access. So then maybe we end up talking about, well, are we talking about the Chinese model or something where the government is going to filter stuff for you? And maybe there's ways around that. Well, let me put it this way. At a bare minimum for Bitcoin to be a global cohesive system, all of the miners have to be able to get blocks to and from all the other miners without any of that getting fucked with at a bare minimum and if somebody's personal node lags behind or gets fucked with it doesn't affect the overall system and second layers can help mitigate the the individual problems with that but at a bare minimum that bar needs to be met that every miner can get their blocks to every other miner and get any other miners blocks without any of that getting fucked with distorted rerouted delayed or just cut off completely because if, if things get cut off completely now you have fragmented forks of bitcoin until that gets reconnected and the reconnection depending on how long it takes could be very disastrous to large amounts of individuals so, so the problem is we don't currently have networks that allow data transmission at speeds that we want that aren't really the internet at the end of the day. Yeah, you can use radio, but to transmit a meg or two, it's a lot of time. It is not, it yeah. is not a little amount of time. It is not nanoseconds. It's not milliseconds. It's probably not even seconds. Minutes. It's probably minutes. It so, is. I think it's, it's something long. like 30 to 40 minutes to propagate a one megabyte block over a long range radio frequency that would get a decent amount of range or something like that. Yeah. So there we go. So that, that doesn't work for Bitcoin, sadly. And the problem with satellites is you need the uplink to go with the downlink. So the downlink is good for everybody reading. It's probably not the fastest thing in the world. I don't know what exactly what the latency is, but it's a lot faster than that radio, right? So um, the question is then, how do you get your blocks to that? And usually the answer is the internet. Now you can sub in all sorts of other texts. You can talk about telephony, uh, carrier pigeons, however you want to get your blocks there. Um, but the modern standard is kind of the internet. And now you can have private networks that do this sort of thing. Broadcast for downstream delivery and more efficient all distributed alternatives for upstream, like something like a, a satellite feed, um, an additional listener costs nothing to that feed. Um, or whoever is maintaining that feed and it's completely private. And then as far as getting your block out, I mean, with compact blocks, you can make that a couple kilobytes. If we end up with internet um access problems that end up fracturing bitcoin we are going to socially be in such a messed up place that bitcoin is going to be incentivized to thrive in ways that we don't even comprehend right now yeah no, but which is why I, I look at this like the military option that it is and it takes place in a much later stage than all the legislative and political options that states already have you know, the scaffolding for which is laid already. But this is the point is if Bitcoin is fractured or distorted, it doesn't even have to get fractured. Um, somebody with a, a, a network operator's privileges um, could just delay one miner's blocks versus another in propagation through the network.
you'd penalize a minor, cut off a specific minor. Like, you, you need to really think at scale globally how the internet itself becomes a thing that could fuck with Bitcoin. And it's like, if the world's that fucked up, yeah, that's when Bitcoin would thrive, but how can it if it can get fucked up in that world? Like my ad, like my attitude about this is in in the long run, Bitcoin should be something that can ride out World War Three, as long as that doesn't become literal like global nuclear holocaust. Well, we're we're nowhere yeah, close to that. It's good. It runs on the internet because that's what the internet's made for. Bitcoin has to catalyze the evolution of a number of systems that it flows through and touches from you know internet protocols to uh computer hardware but and, yeah you know they will catalyze those changes hold on and, and like re real quick folks but like fud yeah technically on a technical level that's what the internet's designed to survive but that doesn't take into account the incentives and that level of shit show for the operators of all of that to start severing connections and balkanizing things cuz there's a shit show going on and we don't we don't want that that free flow of information we want control cuz it's a shit show that's one of those troubling things cuz when you mess with my friends i mess with your friends right and it's very very nice to have an open internet where packets just go where they need to go and that's the end of it right kind of like it's nice to be able to travel wherever you want um yeah. Uh, so as soon as you start balkanizing things, I, things tend to lock down widely, but it's in no one's best interest, especially in a monetary system for that to happen. Yeah, but, you know, it's in every government's interest to kind of fuck with something like Bitcoin and stop it from happening because it screws up all of their game plans. It does. I think the, the fact that Bitcoin guarantees blowback at any stage of you know government attack on it is a very important aspect of its immutability so there's there's going to be game theory choices for governments here and one of them is going to be should part of my reserves be in bitcoin because once somebody says yes to that question then they're not susceptible to this problem anymore but the flip side of that is you don't get to just print paper to finance yourself and if you peg to the us dollar before you don't get a proxy print paper by the us printing paper to finance yourself right um so it would take a very it would take a next generation thinking state to make the switch and i don't know who that's going to be Oh, I think it would it would happen in the heat of the moment out of necessity. And, you know, a issuer of a failing fiat currency can still exploit senior age, can still acquire near arbitrary amounts of Bitcoin when it needs to, but they'll hang on to the exorbitant privilege as long as it serves them. That privilege is one of the defining characteristics of a modern state, I think. Yeah, the and, U.S. has certainly reveled in it. And the point is, though, if if all the, the the things start dominoing, and all of this becomes obvious, you fuck with the internet, you fuck with Bitcoin. Which is why taking minimum, into account at a the, bare minimum, the blocks must flow unimpeded. Yes, it's, it's an important problem to take seriously, but it also does represent you know, something um, a little bit beyond the path of least resistance, which is for governments to, um, you know, further interpret and clarify all of their existing regulations into a way that neuters Bitcoin into a, uh, I think, like I said before, a quasi stonk uh, to the greatest extent possible. Something that won't be a misbehaving, tax evading, um, escape a monetary prison break when you say fuck with the internet are you are you only talking about fuck with the internet as it regards bitcoin or does anything else get messed up when that happens no, certainly or, be or part of a larger program selective... protecting children and hunting down terrorists
or, or just selective things within which Bitcoin falls as a category. Right, but how do you select for just Bitcoin? I'm guessing that there's going to be other things that become problematic, or or can you just select for Bitcoin? Well, you boot up a node, you can start crawling and finding Bitcoin nodes. Um, you watch traffic as a network operator, you can see where all the connections between the Bitcoin nodes are. You can single out miners and where blocks come from and start screwing with those connections. So when does Bitcoin become important enough for this to happen? I don't know. Why would anybody bother doing that at this point? Bitcoin is a little nothing right now. Why would why would people bother with it now? It's still a tiny little nothing. It's the fact that as long as the internet is the only option to make the blocks flow, that's possible. Why would anybody care enough right now? They don't have to care right now. They can care in five years or ten years. Well, and five, then, or ten boom. Years, five or ten years of Bitcoin were sitting at a uh, million dollars of Bitcoin. That's different than, you know, at so 7,500. If we're still dependent on the internet at that time and they put all this together, uh oh. Right, but that's sort of a different world. So you're talking, you know, so that's why I asked you what size because. <clears throat> um, the world is very funny the way it works and, and, and money talks. So, you know, when you're talking about something which is a uh, hundred and some odd billion dollar market cap, it's very different than something that's a $20 trillion market cap. It, it's economic weight, it's heft, it's ability to buy people off becomes a very different thing. And it's hard to imagine uh, a beast which outweighs, you know, let's just talk in today's value terms. You know, that outweighs major markets out there um, and, and starts to, <clears throat> to be competing on a global scale financially, it just, it's just a very different thing. It's the difference between a gecko and Godzilla, which is three miles high. So I, I, <clears throat> I hear what you're saying, but the question is, Bitcoin starts to have its own game theory that's in operation. It's, it's starting to operate as if, in some senses, it's almost a state itself where it has uh, a lot of resources at its command. So it's, it's, it's not clear to me. I, I think people always try to project where Bitcoin is today and what it would be like in this inevitable world when it's getting attacked and still are thinking about what it is in, in its setup today without I mean, there's no reason to attack it right now. It's just way too small. It's it's like um, requires way too much foresight, and you've got people who are busy with too many other things that are pots boiling over um, to really be concerned. Why with Bitcoin. we should think ahead? Oh no, I agree with that. No, I totally agree with that. So you do need to plan ahead, and I'm completely in favor of that. But I'm also saying that it, it, it the resources at people's disposal becomes so much different uh, an ability to literally bribe politicians, you know, to literally pay them off to make sure that, you know, you have the things you need. I mean, this is the way so much of the world works today that, you know, wheels get greased. Um, and, and, and that is as much a piece of game theory as anything else in the way the world works. And it may not be it may not be um, native to Bitcoin itself, but it is native to Bitcoin's social layer. Tina, I am the government of a country that's an important nexus point through which internet traffic flows on physical infrastructure, and I realize I'm very important to lots of mining operations connecting to each other, and so now I start delaying their blocks um, selectively and extort them that could happen things do happen and 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 you know miners can move also they don't have to stay where they are traffic doesn't have to flow through there you're talking about people who can have a lot but, of money Gina, you can have, this is pipes, mining pipes. this is mining your latency costs money i understand but pipes you know other pipes can be laid it doesn't have to root through that country where that's a problem 
Uh, you're talking about people who are going to have a lot of value at their disposal for spending. Um, these are not going to these are be large entities. You know, when you're talking about Bitcoin at ten trillion dollar Bitcoin or twenty trillion dollar Bitcoin, you can have major global players mining. These are not going to be little guys who are you know, mining on a shoestring. You could be talking about some of the world's biggest corporations mining. These people have connections, they have political connections. It, the world just starts to look very different. You're talking about a, a very different thing. You know, when you start engaging in these really kind of global power battles, it's not going to be waged with the people. Uh, now, some of them may grow to those kinds of levels. You've got miners that could start to become, you know, huge, you know, corporations with literally tens and hundreds of billions of dollars in revenue, they become a different entity than they are right now. It just, the whole scale of things start to change. So I, I don't disagree with the concern. I just think it starts to play out very differently as the size of Bitcoin changes quite dramatically. I, I don't know if that makes any sense, but that's how I see it. What happens when a war breaks out? across half a continent and fucks up all the infrastructure there which just alters the entire traffic load of, of, of bits moving around the planet and that completely makes and breaks mining profitability all over the place which has who, who knows what geopolitical consequences because the base infrastructure was not something resilient enough to begin with to, to withstand a disruption like that Look, we're already seeing mining move out of China because of issues there. Um, as Bitcoin becomes larger, you know, Bitcoin at $100,000 Bitcoin, $200,000 Bitcoin, people are going to start doing things differently. You, you might have mining operations that become bigger mining operations that have locations in multiple content, continents in multiple places. Um, people aren't going to just have one location in one place where they run their business from. And as you get players, uh, maybe Square goes into mining and Square becomes a much bigger corporation and they have a, a billion dollar or two billion dollar mining farm. They're not just going to all put it in one place. Um, and you have other very, very large corporations coming. The whole scale of this starts to change. And, and Yeah, but and, Tina, uh, like that distributing your hardware all over the place doesn't matter if the entire latency map of the internet just changes and fucks the profitability of a large amount of your hardware. And that's the point is like Bitcoin needs at a bare minimum, just something distributed for miners to get blocks around to feed the rest of the network, no matter how fragmented it is, that can't get disrupted in those ways, that has multiple redundant entry points to the network to account for disruptions like that. Like it needs to be something that, that can't just get fucked with. If I'm a big enough business doing this, I could put up my own satellites. I don't have to rely on renting somebody else's satellite. If I'm a hundred billion dollar corporation, I put up my own satellites. I don't need to go rent space on somebody else's satellite. The scale of everything starts to change the opportunities for what you can do. And I understand the concern, but it's it becomes different at different scale. So it depends on the scale that you're telling me this is going to happen. And, I, and I'm, uh, your resources at your disposal, how you deal and answer problems like this really starts to change when you're talking about um, the scale that it's happening on with Bitcoin. It matters if it's happening at a, a trillion dollar size or at um, 10 or 20 trillion dollar Bitcoin or bigger because the nature of the players involved are going to start to look very different. The access that they have to um, political power, the access they have to financial resources. So I, I don't think you can talk about it as though it's just one particular static thing today. It's going to look different in a uh, in a different environment for Bitcoin based on how many users you have, how what the market cap is. It, it's so it kind of matters what you're talking about. I think.
I think that all of those things, Tina, suffers systemic choke points, like who can get stuff up there, who wears a choke point there, what can fuck with that. Like, yeah, I think all of those things will happen, but those are all things with choke points that can be fucked with by governments, which is ultimately the concern here in terms of bedrock internet infrastructure. And it's just like it, it, it's a it's a fucking choke point. And not- I want I want to see a Bitcoin that is hardened enough that you could literally see World War Three break out all across Africa and the Middle East and just fuck physical infrastructure, cables all over the place get cut. And that wouldn't fuck with Bitcoin. That's that's how hardened I want to see Bitcoin. Otherwise, the next time we have some global disaster, it's just going to take down Bitcoin. At uh, different sizes of Bitcoin's market cap and users, you're going to see that because people will think about that and build for that unless they're foolish, unless they you know, go the model that we've gone with our supply chains. I and mean, we've already seen what happens when supply chains start to break. This is not any different than a supply chain question, really. It's the same question from my perspective. It's not a different question. So having lived through Corona is going to make businesses think differently about supply chains. This is just an internet supply chain. It's really the same thing. Yeah, you've described a lot of problems that the internet was built to mitigate, so it will mitigate them the way it does. But will it, dude? I mean, you say that um, with the kind of cavalier attitude of people who dismissed the the nothing can be trusted tin foilies, and it's like, how often do we see the data shaping attacks? to route traffic through places it shouldn't have gone, like countries tactically taking advantage of that. Like that's kind of just a common thing right now in the unspoken of constant state of digital warfare everybody's in. And Bitcoin is still highly susceptible to that without pressure release valves that are not that infrastructure. I don't well, think you can mitigate for that at the Bitcoin layer. I think you have to mitigate for it at the internet layer. Because Bitcoin runs on the internet. No, like I said in chat, when you said that in chat, Bitcoin is theoretically the substrate that's, that's, agnostic. Our chat. Oh, I see. Sorry. Uh, substrate agnostic theoretically. Yeah, so is everything. So are carrier pigeons. You don't need carrier pigeons to pass notes. You can just pass carrier pigeons, digital ones on the internet, right? Like do what you want as far as that. It's just the internet is built to handle this. And yet you can attack all sorts of different things, all sorts of different ways. I liked when Verizon, I believe, was dropping keyframes from Netflix videos that were traversing the internet on their, you know, internet bandwidth. So somebody gets a Blu-ray copy and they're going to stream 50 gigs to their house. Well, what am I going to do? Hmm, let's look at those frames. Okay, every 30 or so, there's a keyframe that updates your whole screen, whatever it is, right? We're, we're just going to drop those. We'll let every other frame get through. It's just when those keyframes drop, you see the artifacting like you occasionally see on video, right? So eventually it was bad enough and and somebody at um you know netflix documented it and got it written up in a major publication and then everybody got to talk about why their netflix were dropping frames and the fact they were paying for verizon service that was intentionally dropping frames to them right so things will bubble up things will get dealt with you know wars will happen and the internet will react um to say that there's a problem for bitcoin when a war happens is to emphasize the wrong way around it right because there's a problem for everybody when a war happens but the point is the internet is made to reroute traffic and yeah there will be gateways there there will, will be people analyzing traffic luckily you know i'm sure those biggest miners have encrypted back channels to each other and run private networks and they update each other that way of blocks to be really really fast about it. i'm sure they pay for high quality internet lines no a lot of them actually just run a publicly known like hooked up uh, relay network that they everybody do that knows too. about they should do that also 
It's just if they want those back channel connections to really publish the blocks fast, they can do that. I think apart from the uh, uh, technical solutions uh, or uh, technology and the internet, maybe over time uh, every government has some connection with Bitcoin themselves by owning it or mining it or something. So they will have an incentive to, uh, to maintain uh, the network. Like we live in a world where one of the most populated countries in the planet's entire internet is behind a national firewall. Um, Russia literally just tested a system last year to physically isolate their entire country's internet from the rest of the world. Like the idea that those types of fissures could just open up on the internet is not a meme and it's yeah fud the the theoretical academic paper design of the internet is to route around things like that that does not take into account the political reality of i'm intentionally undermining that which is well, a, a political trend that is is really seems to be catching on everywhere and to some crazy degrees in a few places you start to you start to put yourself so so let's imagine a world where bitcoin is a is, is a million dollar bitcoin or two million or five million dollar bitcoin and let's say that china really wants to wall itself off completely and doesn't let its miners communicate <clears throat> with uh with the Bitcoin network, so its miners suffer. So basically, you're saying that China just wants to shoot itself in the head vis-a-vis -vis Bitcoin. Uh, so they're gonna do this thing, and, and they're gonna they're gonna cut them. They're gonna cut off their nose to spite their face. Um, they might do that. That's kind of gonna be their problem. And maybe they have a long enough arm they can reach and they can cripple some other points. But then. Business will just have to move to other locations to route around that or find alternative ways to route around it. But I mean, if somebody wants to go commit financial suicide, you kind of can't stop them from doing it. So, yeah, you're, you're right. That may happen. And kind of your tough luck that you're going to do that stupid thing. But people do do stupid things all the time. So maybe you can't stop that. Maybe people will just cut off their own noses to spite their own faces. Luckily, we're growing pressure against that. The more Bitcoin integrates into or drops its tendrils into the existing system and finds revenue models um, that are um, symbiotic with what's already going on, whether it's oil and gas. Interrupted. Or whatever the hell, you know, somebody's doing, you know, insert other example here. For me, the big moment was when CME said they were going to do a Bitcoin contract. They're kind of foundational in the commodity space. And if the government entities that approve all that stuff said, OK, you can do a Bitcoin contract. That was kind of the moment to me that we got deep enough into the U.S. financial system that I was not sure I need to be worried anymore about us getting kicked out of it. Like they, that was pretty much Bitcoin has arrived and it's accepted. But do they want to fuck with it? Do they change their mind and take radical actions? Do other governments that disrupt the whole system as a whole? Like, like I mean, did they, especially right now, like we're probably going to trend globally in a very isolationist, direction in a lot of places like how hard does that swing the good thing is all of that is lindy the longer it exists and the people are used to the fact that it exists and accept it trade it you know use it to make money whatever whatever um the longer it will exist in general so that's a good thing and anybody who isolates themselves from it has a class of populace that is getting not just ignored, but 
is kind of getting oppressed by not getting to be involved in it. And some of that class will go elsewhere and that will cost them. But also the more valuable it gets over time, while it's in some kind of Lindy acceptance upswing, and the more the price comes up, the more influence those involved have within their own system. And that is kind of a natural anti-pressure from big changes to that system. And so far we've been on a very nice glide path with respect to that, at least in the US, I've felt that way. Yeah, but, you know, again, things fucking change really goddamn fast. They can, but is if uh, let me give you another data point. If Fidelity can sell me Bitcoin that they custody, I don't think there's any chance the U.S. ever gives it up. You get Bitcoin represented directly in somebody's 401k or whatever, it's just done. Like, that's just corn or wheat or whatever. Nobody cares anymore. Like, and, and who is it threatening? So, uh, like the question came up earlier about Bitcoin causing friction and, and getting a pushback. I'm interested in what ways Bitcoin would directly cause that friction because it's had almost every opportunity to cause any kind of friction that it can. And really all, all we expect it to do is, you know, kind of get bigger, be that monetary black hole, slowly suck up capital as people recognize what's going on in the world around them, especially vis-a-vis -vis printing money and what does value mean and all that stuff and you know it, i don't see the the binary events there that all of a sudden it threatens a government or whatever here's okay. the disruption it completely fucks with the entire notion of modern monetary theory and trying to move in that direction because it's a release valve now the more they try to implement that the more they just shoot themselves in the foot because people stampede into something like Bitcoin. But people yeah, it's, it's not achieved anywhere near enough of a social scale, I think, to be apparently um, a thorn in government style. But when the store, you know, the tradable um, asset, speculative or store value, what do you want to call it, uh, when that utility starts to seep into, oh, and you can also make anonymous transactions with this uh you can go dark with this that's once that starts to really rear its head i think that's where you're going to see the government try and carve as deep a chasm as it can into um through the middle of bitcoin and divide it into you know sanctioned approved versus unapproved um you know try and make it illegal to go dark with bitcoin i anticipate That'll be that'll be that'll be a losing battle. Uh, Bitcoin at half a million, a trillion, uh, half a million dollar Bitcoin, million dollar Bitcoin. That'll be a complete losing battle. They won't be able to do it. Um, and and bear in mind, as it gets bigger and as 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 more and more people own it, you know, bear in mind who the people are that are going to own it. They're going to be rich people who own it, and rich people, people are going to people are going to use their wealth to to lobby politicians, to write laws, to change things. Bitcoin, as it gets bigger, starts to have a larger political voice because you're going to have people who are going to organize themselves in political packs the way businesses do, the way the banking system organizes into political packs and gives money to people who get what they want them to get through political lobbying. Um, the more heft you have financially, the more influence you have in what those laws are and how they get written and how they get enforced you know it, it it does matter it's not it's not just bitcoin on the receiving end of the lash all the time sometimes it'll be bitcoin holding that whip i, I don't see it like that i just don't see it like that to not take advantage of that financial influence to get things which benefit bitcoin I don't see that world existing. I don't know why people would do that. I mean, I've heard some guys say, oh, political political uh, politics doesn't scale. Well, that's just a naive point of view because there are going to be more than enough people who do understand that it matters when you get congressmen and senators to, you know, support your 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 wants and your needs because you're giving them political donations and presidents too that's just how the world works and i think the world will continue working that way yeah i i, I agree there is a tipping point um i wouldn't personally commit to 
any time frame for its achievement. You know, you're talking about ten million dollar Bitcoin. Like, no, I think it'll happen. Let's, I, let's I think it'll happen. It. I think it'll happen in less less than five years. It'll happen in less than five years. It'll happen anything over. It'll start to happen anything over a hundred thousand dollar Bitcoin. It's going to happen really fast because people are really smart and people get that. And uh, Bitcoin's not going to be, pardon the expression, sucking high tit to anybody else. Bitcoiners are pretty aggressive, actually. They're a pretty aggressive bunch. They're going to figure this out, and they're going to figure out that they don't want to be anybody's bitch. If anything, you know what you mean. if anything, if anything, the legacy system is going to be Bitcoin's bitch. Yeah, it's going to be a cornered one. Well, the, one the legacy I'll... system or Bitcoin? Who's going to be cornered? The legacy system and you know institutional self-preservation is always intrinsically goal number one and that's that's the arbitrary counter yeah i understand, I understand. In, the meantime, in the meantime that is going to throw busy, itself in the meantime Bitcoin they're busy tying themselves up in the meantime they're busy tying themselves up with craziness and bitcoin will be growing ever larger ever more influential ever more powerful so yeah i understand that i understand these native fears that people have but they've got to stop cowering in the in the corner bitcoin is about to explode in size and in the 2020s a lot of stuff is going to happen very differently bitcoin is not going to be this little cowering nothing hiding in the corner bitcoin's going to be a goddamn big thing and and when bitcoin walks the world will shake we're not there yet but it's going to happen and it's not going to take that many years for this to happen bitcoin is going to be very powerful very influential and Bitcoiners are, are not, they're not soft little mamby-pamby types of people. These are people who are mostly pretty tough and, and they have an idea of the world they want to see. And, you know, when you start giving people who've been in Bitcoin for a while some financial influence, when a hundred Bitcoin grows to, oh, I don't know, 20, 30, 50 million dollars in value, you start to have a voice. You know, you can pretty easily give twenty, thirty, fifty thousand dollars to political action committees that go give money to senators and congressmen and presidents and put together, you know, a hundred million dollar pack, two hundred million dollar, billion dollar pack. You start to have some influence in the world. That's just how the world works. All right, let's not put the card in front of the horse though on Bitcoin's ability to galvanize a rabid pack of supporters in size, you know. A lot of people are going to join our monetary community in the coming years, not necessarily going to join our epistemic community. They don't need to, but people do love to protect the thing that's theirs. It's funny how when I have that value that grew in size that I kind of want to protect it, people are really funny that way. They they love to protect their wealth and their money. It's It's weird. I don't understand why it happens, but people seem to do it all the time. Yeah, but without a widespread, real, like, philosophical foundation for doing so, I expect adoption to be um, lurching and pretty much driven by necessity. You know, leading I don't know, you, in, you, you always, in places with a lot of monetary oppression. Yeah, I don't think so. People like to make money, and and and, and as it grows in size, people are going to like to make more money. And when Bitcoin becomes one of the only avenues for this happening, it's going to become very desirable, and lots of people can climb on board. People people love making money, and Bitcoin's designed to uh, to pump. And you're going to be in an environment where the legacy system is going to be pumping its value. I just don't see it like this. I I, I think Bitcoin is is not the scared little creature that you want to see. I, I see it as something very, very different. But you're, you have these fears. I don't see them. No, anymore. see, that's funny because you think Bitcoin has to get big fast. And I think it has all the time it wants to take to do so. If Bitcoin doesn't get big fast, Bitcoin won't exist. Bitcoin is going to happen very fast, i.e. 10, 15 years, 20 years, or it's never going to happen. Bitcoin will just fade off into into a distant memory, but it, by its nature, that is it's not what grow the protocol is designed to do. The protocol yeah, is designed I, I, to withstand time in a way except, that stimulates except, gold. And yeah, you can, yeah, I know. Except, except that's just not how the world works. That's just a that's a false notion. Things happen very fast. Changes happen very fast. Lenin said it best. There are uh, decades when nothing happened. And there are weeks when decades happen. 
this is Bitcoin's time and it's going to happen incredibly fast. Collection um, points happen fast, but Bitcoin can remain zygotic for as long as it, it needs to. There is there is nothing stopping it from persisting. And that's the very basis for its value in the first place. You keep thinking that. I, 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 I take, I'll, take the, I'll take the other side of that. I that think that if is... Bitcoin can't withstand time without changing in the ways that we expect it not to change, what, what the hell is it? I didn't say it's not going to change. I just said it's going to happen very, very fast. I think you'll see enormous changes in what this thing is in terms of its size and reach, its influence in the next several years. And I think the next one to three years, uh, we're going to get a very good insight into what that looks like. If, if, if Bitcoin does financially what I think it will do in the next one to three years, a lot of people's tune is going to change. I'm optimistic for that, but um, I also don't see any way in which Bitcoin is relegated to a historical backwater if it doesn't keep mooning, you know, in rapid iterations like it has been these last few years. To it's, it, quote these first few Bill years, Clinton, it's the incentive, stupid. Well, okay, so what if Bitcoin only doubled in value every four years? What if then? Is it failing? I mean, that's that would be a sign of a continued healthy progression toward, I, I don't know whether I want to say hyper-Bitcoinization. I don't know whether I find that concept really well-formed. Um, but yeah, no, that would, that would be very promising. I would continue thinking what I think now and feel more confident in that based on more data. Bitcoin will be pretty much of a dead project by 2030. If it can only double every four years, it'll be a pretty dead project and there won't be too many people in it. I expect you'll see several hundred thousand dollar Bitcoin in the next year to three years. And I think you'll see million dollar Bitcoin 2025, 2026, 2027 at the outside. Um, I think you'll see shocking moves. If all this money printing and a fixed supply doesn't get this thing to go up an awful lot, there's nothing here. I feel like we're talking about the difference between a, a protocol and an app. Don't worry, everybody will tell you that stock to flow predictions were wrong and it was all the epidemic and money printing. I'm okay with that. It doesn't matter to me. You know, it doesn't matter if the pitcher hits the stone or the stone hits the pitcher. It's going to be bad for the pitcher. In this case, for Bitcoin, it doesn't matter if it was stock to flow or the epidemic. It's going to be good for Bitcoin's price. And it just doesn't matter. And if we're sitting at half million dollar Bitcoin in, I don't know, four years, then the stock to flow guys, the, the anti stock to flow guys want to say it wasn't stock to flow. I'll say, <laughs> I don't care. Why would I care? Doesn't matter. You roll a dice, you get a six. Next year, Bitcoin goes to 100 grand. Did it matter? Not to me. The point is, it went to 100 grand. That's exactly right. So how the fuck did we get here from the internet infrastructure and mining? We uh, said a little bit, another beer? bit into the nation state attacks, motivations, you know, likely methods. People just love the stock to flow, Shinobi. It's all about stock to flow, Shinobi. It's all about making money. Bitcoin succeeds because everybody loves to make money. And if it weren't for the price going up, most of us would not be here today. It would be a, a little nerd's toy at $10 and probably maybe nobody in this chat room would be talking about it. And Tina, that's what you're ignoring about Bitcoin and the potential for these kinds of attacks on things like the internet infrastructure it runs on. Is Bitcoin making some people money fucks with other people's money and they have an incentive to fuck with bitcoin no doubt about it that and and bitcoin if it can't if it can't route around this and make that work then it can never become what i think it can become it, bitcoin has from its inception been the sewer rat 
that fights all comers and wins. So I expect that if the social layer is what makes it anti-fragile, which is what I think happens, then that process will continue. And I have confidence that the nature of what this is will continue to be the sewer rat, will continue to deal with all the things that get thrown at it, and it will continue to come out on top. Uh, I just think that that's the nature of, of, of the incentive structure of Bitcoin. And I think it's social error is what makes it anti-fragile. And it's a good thing that people ask these questions and try to figure Who out how to... Who remembers Chain Anchor? Not, not sure I know one. From MIT in 2016... They literally wrote a whole paper and formally specified a protocol to bribe miners to preferably confirm transactions that attach KYC information with uh, yes. the intent to gradually shift to only mining KYC transactions to orphaning blocks that include non-KYC transactions. So now, think... Think about how subtly fucking with internet traffic and rerouting things and playing games and snooping on that um, can, you know, preferentially benefit one group of miners who, who might be um, okay with things like that. Because it, it, it's that, 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 that whole notion... And that whole design and that whole understanding of the incentives here um, that's shown in that paper didn't just go away um, when the year changed to 2017. You think other yeah, billionaires didn't last when... Uh, uh, pass up and take the wait and see. And they're, they're adding these arrows to their quiver. I'm pretty sure a lot of billionaires laughed at Bezos when his dick pics leaked. And yet, exactly for the reason that I just said, that you are part of what makes Bitcoin anti-fragile, and the fact that you are not alone in knowing and understanding these things, Bitcoin's social error is what, is what really makes this thing an anti-fragile yeah, but it has a dense core and a very um, a much more diffuse uh, and fickle periphery. You know, most so-called Bitcoin owners, they don't control keys. They um, have not blocked uh, chain analysis identification. They're not anonymous. They're they're nowhere near fully sovereign under the Bitcoin model. So you know, I don't think we can count our forces as large as they might look. It actually doesn't take a lot of people to get certain things done. Um, it's, it, but to hold a price several orders of magnitude above what it is currently, you need a lot of people with the, the motive and the ability to pay the opportunity cost of holding Bitcoin. Much higher get, opportunity cost in aggregate. No, I don't think so, really. I, I, I think it's going to be pretty easy. And I think you're going to find that there, you know, you, you've had a lot of Bitcoin move into the hands of people who are looking for much bigger returns. I, I think it doesn't take that much money at all in this global financial system that we're in. And, and, and again, uh, not everybody has to be motivated by the same by the by the, by the same uh, things you just need just enough people to be concerned about that not everybody has to be um, I don't want to go to this uh, this route that I was going to go because it's I'm, I'm not strong enough in my knowledge there to, to give it as an example you you, you don't need that many you just don't need that many fighters to to win big battles and to keep populations under control. It doesn't take that many people. It, it doesn't. Minority. It just doesn't take as many people as, as people think. It's it, I don't know. I I I I I've got a lot of confidence in the nature of the Bitcoin community. I I think it's well, 
we'll find out, you know, as I said, we'll find out. Um, I, I'm pretty confident in what it is, and we'll see if I'm right or I'm wrong. Maybe I'm wrong. I don't think I am. I think largely we project the same destination for Bitcoin. We're just winding up with very different models of how it gets there and what trials and tribulations it faces on the way. The core point, though, is is just like the like dependencies. Dependencies are attack surfaces, and right now, inextric or inextricably, in the long line of dependencies Bitcoin has, the internet is one of them, and that's a thing that governments and different organizations can exert a lot of influence on and like there's this this constant meme that the government doesn't understand this space and that like that meme is a head up in ass doesn't matter that a politician doesn't get this, that some idiot half senile person in Congress doesn't. They don't handle anything. They eventually go do something and it gets delegated down to a subcommittee to some fucking bureaucratic institution that actually does pay attention to shit and specialize in shit and does have a decent idea of what's going on and they handle it. And the fact that four years ago, MIT was looking at things like playing the miners' incentives against themselves to layer KYC on top of the base of Bitcoin. Like, that's not a just shrug that off. It, it, it'll work out. That was four years ago. I guess I'd just be so much more worried if there weren't people like you worried about this stuff. And there are people who are working on looking at these issues. Um, I, I would just see it very differently than I do. Academics love to look at the nuances of systems like this and say, ah, yes, we might be able to tweak them or make them more efficient or less or add this or what have you. And uh, yeah, so it's natural that somebody would go there. I would say one thing that you can note is that nobody has taken up the mantle of that paper yet. Like that hasn't shipped. That's not getting used. And that's a good thing. It, it might also imply that, something. Because that dependency ultimately boils down to meat space, which equals who can project force. And that probably only would ever get implemented after a, you know, culmination of um, conflicts between states and Bitcoin. That's real gloves come off stuff. You know, because this is like, you know, the 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 digest that we just did with Marty before this. Like, you know, half of it, we got into the whole flare mining and great American mining and shit. And I was kind of looking at the the skeptical side of like, how could the, that make things wonky or not go the best way? But like the one thing I was pointing out was on the positive side that it's encouraging just architecturally and like technically distributed modular mobile transportable designs for just how you set mining equipment up and you know that's like that that base layer needs to be that agile it needs to be that mobile it needs to be able to move out from under the shadow of a government or a region that decides to come down and go hey we want you to install this chain anchor thing or, or chain anchor 2.0 or whatever the fuck they, they, they come up with to try this sort of thing next because like it's, it's, it's like really flip a coin. Um, that's the odds that kind of shit starts happening in the next five to 10 years. 
the more spread the miners get, the better we are resistant to that. Uh, be it across nation states, be it across individual states, be it across whatever. Um, just having more jurisdictions is better because the more feet you have to put on the ground to affect that policy, the better, right? Um, so I'm hopeful for that. But that does kind of come back to what we were talking about, about just availability of mining hardware. And I don't know about you, but I don't read Chinese. So I go to like what's minor or something and their whole site is in Chinese, doesn't even try to translate to English. And it's like, okay, I understand who your market is. It's obviously not me. The point is though, you know, that, that that's the first leg of that. But then the second leg is effectively like through many degrees of indirection, all of those distributed pieces of equipment have to talk to each other. And that's the next choke point. Because, you know, like I said, like I said earlier, it's like you can play all kinds of games. I can fuck with like your mining operation if I have a high enough like uh, network control of you. I'll fuck with your blocks. I'll drop your blocks. I'll try to do everything I can to stop your blocks getting to the network, period. And if I can't do that, I'll slow it down as much as I can. And I'm doing that because you don't want to run chain anchor. This is why exactly the same meterage of cable is run to every single server uh, that co-host with NYSE or someplace because nobody should get the millisecond advantage based on what rack they're in. It's that simple. But this always happens in financial markets. Don't you have guys like uh, Gleb Namenko working on things like Erle for uh, Rebus attacks? Isn't this really the same kind of thing you're talking about? Uh, maybe that maybe Rebus attack is not exactly what you're des describing, but don't you have well, people thinking about these types of issues? See, the all of these peer-to-peer -peer, uh, optimizations are like some are being done for different reasons. Erle is done a lot like that there is a big bandwidth improvement um it's not going to help with latency though it makes it worse um but the bandwidth improvement you can either just save bandwidth or you can connect to more nodes to be more civil resistant now that was but, my, my my point was not the technical aspects of this i was not trying to discuss the technical aspects but it's I was, like I was it's that, pointing it, out it's it's pointing that, out is your concerns are concerns that can be addressed no, but my point is that that specifically doesn't really address this this concern that wasn't that wasn't exactly my point my point was that you had somebody who recognized well, that there was well i because the, the, there's a little more to it like, like compact blocks is something that was done to streamline the latency between um you know, different uh, nodes on the network and get blocks across the network faster. And the idea is like that the big motive behind that is miners are using centralized relay backbones between each other to get blocks to them first um, and improve the latency of the peer to peer network so they can use that. They're still using centralized re relay networks and things like compact blocks like ultimately doesn't help if I can find your pipe that your miners are hooked up to and fuck with that. Or, or if I'm like in between you and where you want to get it the best route and I fuck with that when you send it through me. But as long as you have people thinking about these issues, look, in the worst case scenario, you might have to move to another geography. Yeah, my point, it's like, really think about this, Tina. This, it's little subtle ways that you can herd miners or that you can block out certain miners in, in areas from being profitable. If you can pull the strings on the actual network backbones or on the ISP connection points. And like, you can really like, there's a lot of subtle ways in which you can fuck with that. Like I'm going around trying to get miners to install chain anchor 
and you won't do that. Oopsies. So I guess there need to be people who continue to look for these sorts of attacks and look to plan to how you work around them. Um, if there are no workarounds for attacks like this, then Bitcoin ultimately won't succeed. The workaround is streamline shit and start building bridge gaps or alternatives. I'm not telling you I know what the workaround is. I'm just saying that you have people who are thinking about potential attacks and trying to plan for them. So if you're not going to think in an adversarial framework, then that will be a problem. But you do have people who think in, in from an adversarial perspective. So as long as Bitcoin... Bitcoiners think of themselves in those terms, they're going to look for their weak points. Once they stop thinking that way, then Bitcoin becomes vulnerable. Encrypt your web traffic, people. Timing analysis, people. Bitcoin oh, yeah. blocks are published randomly, people. Yeah, but anybody can see when they're published. Oh. Uh oh. Uh oh. I'm just saying, if you're a miner, you could put it on an encrypted back channel to some node that you just spun up 10 minutes ago randomly with the blocks to uh, publish to anybody else. So, like, there's all sorts of ways miners could try to what? mitigate what? this. Were those and packets the size of that block? Yep. Were they around the time that block got? Oh my, else. Yep. oh my god, lost padding. Oh my god. Come on. What if we end up having to smuggle the blocks manually in our cavities? I'm just I'm just I'm just driving home the issue because you're you've now um Mr. Fudd gone from the internet solves this to um I think you just described a mix a mix that what what was that is that what you what you did I'm I'm just trying to take what you think is a problem which really isn't because the internet and bitcoin is an application layer protocol that runs on the internet and yeah you can try to mitigate things about the internet uh to get your bitcoin whatever's wherever um Fine, do that. Uh, but I do like talking about prison wallets, so I'm into this. I think all Bitcoin blocks should be produced on open dimes and should be have to smuggle, be smuggled in at least 10 prison wallets to be valid. So the question is, how quickly can you smuggle an open dime in 10 prison wallets? You've had too much to drink, sir. Dude, all I'm asking for is validation of prison wallet entry and exit. Too much to drink. I'm on my uh, fourth uh, Colorado produced alcoholic beverage. I'm enjoying it. The internet itself is a threat that Bitcoin must take into account, wow. despite existing on top of it, or bad things will happen. Maybe Bitcoin will buy out the internet. Like uh, Justin Tron buying out BitTorrent or something. Justin Sun, whoever. That's not how any of this works. All right, so Shinobi thinks Bitcoin will buy the internet. Uh, Tina thinks Bitcoin will be a million dollars before 2030. Um, I think... I don't know what I think. I think I'm about to call this uh, wraps. Because this is this is started... Uh, Diminishing return curve slide. <laughs> yeah, just <cut> it. <laughs> we did some good adversarial thinking. Exactly. We can pat ourselves on the back for that. Cut it 30 minutes ago and ship it. Well, that was drunk. <laughs>